darkest night. Her voice is heard through the breaking dawn. Her voice is heard through the heart of life. Her voice is heard, all creation sings, God is heard. Come, let us praise our God, come, let us sing for joy. With a love of thanks we give honor. You are a mighty God, you are a source of life. Created God, we give you praise. A Santa Son of Yesu, a Santa Son of Yesu, a Santa Son of Yesu, more your A Santa Son of Yes, 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 a Santa Son of everybody. Wonderful to see your lovely smiling faces this morning. Um, for those I may not have met before, my name's Michelle. I'm one of the pastors here at the Gap Uniting Church and it's my privilege to lead you just in the starting part of our worship this morning and then I'll be handing over to Rod because I will be joining our GROW program this morning to see what is going on out there. Now, if that sounds interesting to you, you are very welcome to join us as well. I'm sure Rod won't be offended if you come out there instead of staying in here today. Um, those who may not be aware, our GROW program kicked off for the year last week with a fantastic, exciting week. Um, lots of kids, lots of adults out there helping, and they were doing some drama last week and looking at the drama of the Easter story and the week leading up to the resurrection and everything that was happening at that time. Now this week, they're still going to be exploring the Easter story, so each of our Easter rotations for Grow is our Easter story, but this week we're doing it through the medium of cooking. And there might be something happening out at Grow that is going to be brought in a little later to be part of our worship service this morning as well. 
So if that's something that you would like to join in with our young people um, and come out and learn a bit about God and the Easter story, please feel free to join us. We'll be heading out very soon. For those who might be joining us online, you are very welcome. Um, we'd love for you to pop in the chat maybe where you're joining us from this morning, whether that's your home, here in an, a local area, or whether you might be joining us from further afar. Um, it's great to know how far our worship is connecting with people. I would love to invite you to join me as we share our call to worship this morning. Um, your words will be in, I think, blue font. Thanks, Lottie. And for those who might struggle to see the screen, it's a simple sentence we're going to say three different times, and the words are simply, God welcomes us all. That is the response that you'll be giving. This is God's house. God welcomes us all. These are God's people. God welcomes us all. With empty hands and full hearts, we come. God welcomes us all. Let us stand, if we're able, and sing our praises to this God who welcomes us all in this morning, welcomes us to his kingdom, and those who are heading out to grow towards the end of this song, we'd love you to join us to head out to Upper John Knox. But let's stand and sing our praises to God this morning. Two, three, four.
would you be seated? We come before God with our prayers of approach and our prayers of confession. So let us pray. Lord, when we approach you in worship, we praise you that you fling wide the gates. When we enter your courts, you clear a path before us. Your welcome knows no bounds and your love no conditions. For it is your will that all who wish should meet you here. And so with your welcome ringing in our ears, may our hearts always be prepared to make room for others. To scoot along and budge up so that everyone finds a seat. And none are prevented from meeting you here. And from experiencing in us the God who always accommodates all who worship. And yet, Lord, we know that sometimes that's not us. So we bring our prayers of confession to you this morning. Knowing that you hear, that you forgive. Jesus, cleanser of temples and of souls. At this midpoint in our Lenten journey, look deep within our hearts and our lives. Clear away all those things that clutter and hold us back. May our minds, spirits and bodies be a temple that is open to your presence. May our words and our actions be transparent to your love and truth. We pray that this church community will be purified in its life and mission so that all we do in and from this place may reveal your good news to others. In a moment of silence, we sit before you and name those things for which we seek your cleansing and healing so that we may be more faithful disciples. Friends of Jesus, we are made clean by the words he has spoken to us. There is room in our lives and in our community for the Holy One to dwell. Let us rejoice as we hear Christ's word of grace. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Not an easy peace, not a half-hearted peace, but the peace of the Lord be with you all. I invite you to share a sign of the peace, um, however you'd like, with those around you. We'll do that just for a short time as we share that peace around the room this morning. As we continue in our, in our prayers and reflection, just remain seated as we hear a song that's probably new for most of us. Uh, you'll be invited to join in with the chorus and Valerie will give us a cue um, when to do that. God for your glory. 
So today our theme for Lent 3 is about laws and love and uh, how sometimes Jesus can upset us. And in this season of Lent, if we're not being disturbed by the gospel readings, we need to ask ourselves, why not? There are places in our house where laws and love intersect. Well, hopefully. Sometimes they get a little bit out of balance. And often it's to do with people who are really good at a place for everything and everything in its place. Now, in any household, there's usually some people who are better than that at others. Right? And I'm not mentioning any names, but we're, we know who they are. And God bless them, because without them, we'd all be lost. Um, and some, in some parts of the house where everything has a place and everything needs to go there, um, some, like the shed or the garage is one of those places, often in people's house. The kitchen's probably the other. Are there any other places that I'm oblivious to? Bathroom. Bathroom. Linen cupboard. cupboard. Thanks, Jen. (laughs) I did label all the the shelves at one stage. It helped me more than Jen. Jen went, I know that. But but we understand, right? Um, And those of us who are more inclined to know where things should go, and all of us have a place in life where that's true... um, If someone comes and moves it, that's not fun. Like some people go, well, you say knives, forks, spoons, so why aren't they knives, forks, spoons? And people go, well, that's that's how I've done it. Or if people put, you know, the the things, implements for cooking, some go, oh, no, they have their own drawer. And others go, no, 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 it's the third drawer, next to the plastic bags, bread ties and vouchers or whatever. We understand the feeling of when someone messes with that. When I went to visit Bob and Pam, um, I'm sure they were people who always had things in the right place. But sometimes circumstances in life shift and things trump that. So love and law intention, love trumped that because, well, Pam, not sure where everything was and now things are different. So there's a pretty great system. I don't know it. But Pop and Pam do. Things that need to be got are at the right height. If Pam had 2020 vision, I'm sure she wouldn't arrange it the way it is now. But the way it is now is great. Done out of love so that it can help people to function. Pam even, have, even has her own microwave. You can ask her about that after the service. But today's story in Lent is one perhaps we're familiar with. We we see it in all four Gospels, but sometimes we don't get disturbed enough by it. So Owen's going to bring us the reading, John's, John's account of this particular reading of Jesus coming to church and upsetting people. And after that, we're going to hear another perspective that we don't see in Scripture that perhaps is important because we might relate to it more. So I invite Owen to come and bring us that scripture. And and Peter, if you want to come and get ready, um, we'll hear two different perspectives of that story this morning. Oh, sorry, Valerie. What did I say? Sorry, Owen. (laughs) Valerie and and Peter. (laughs) So that's me breaking the rules. Sorry, (laughs) Owen. been a lot going on in this church this weekend. So I'm reading from the Gospel of John, once I find it, and the second chapter, which comes at the beginning. Our Gospel reading is from the second chapter of John, verses 13 to 22. Jesus cleansing the temple. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, 
Take those things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And this is the word of the Lord. You know, my family have had a stall in this temple for generations. My father, his father before that, his father even before that. We've all run this stall, selling the best quality doves and sheep for sacrifice. We've personally sourced the animals from the best local farmers around. We must meticulously inspected them at the point of sale. We've cared for them and then before we sold them on to the uh, to one of the pilgrims. This stall was not just a job for me, it was a way of life, a tradition, an expression of my religious devotion and duty to ensure that animals that were offered to God were the very best, best available. Sure, there were others out to make a quick denarii or two, but not me. This to me was a job of devotion. Many of the pilgrims thought, of course, that we ripped them off. However, we had to cover all our costs we had to rent the stall site, you all know all this, rent the stall site, there were taxes on every animal sold, um, and uh, of course a host of certificates for trading in this temple, and, uh, and good animals of course don't come cheaply, and we had to pay for all this, and the profits we made helped my family live, but we certainly weren't living in the lap of luxury. Well today, something happened that all my years of trading in this holy temple I had never, ever witnessed before. It was like a wild mob running riot through the temple causing mayhem. We thought at first that it was some foreign insurgents attacking our, our holy temple and we would have taken up arms and fought to the last man to defeat them from desecrating this holy place. Well, it actually turned out it was one of our own who caused all the trouble. His name was Jesus from Nazareth. He'd been making quite a name for himself as a teacher and a healer and a number of people had already started to proclaim him as the Messiah. In, in fact, the other day, he arrived in the city on a donkey. and People were raising palm, palm fronds in the air and they were laying down their coats before him and hailing him as a king. Well, I ask you, what kind of king would overturn the tables of legitimate businessmen going about their godly business? What kind of king would set animals free and take up a whip and chase people out of the temple? What kind of king would sat, act in such a violent, ungodly way? Well, yes, I know, you can think of other kings, I'm sure, that have acted in such a violent and ungodly way. But what this Jesus did today was beyond the pale. Jesus said that we were turning God's holy house into a den of thieves and, ro thieves and robbers, but we were not the ones acting violently. We were the ones going about our legitimate godly business and not wrecking stalls and chasing people with whips. This is no gentle, meek and mild king. This is a dangerous and violent individual determined to undermine the religious authorities and the good, honest, working people of Jerusalem. Well, the religious authorities dealt quickly with the incident, but I must say I was frightened and upset by this personal attack and I hope that they ban him from all future temple events and let us get on with our godly business. But I fear this is not the end of the story or the last we will hear of this Jesus of Nazareth.
so far in Lent, we've been coming across two themes that start with C. Covenant and the cross. Both of these redefine our understanding of God and what it means to follow Jesus. Each week through this season of Lent, one of our readings from the Old Testament is one of the covenants that God makes with God's people. Something they all have in common is that these are initiated by God. A reminder of God's faithfulness to God's self, to, to the person and nature of God, and to those whom God loves. Covenant also talks and speaks to the identity of God. Not only of faithfulness, but a God of preservation, not destruction. And through our gospel readings, we've been reminded again that our journey through Lent, we cannot avoid the cross. In our first week, we looked at trusting God in tough times. Jesus in the wilderness as a model of discipleship for us. There will be hard times, that's life. And in this season of Lent, we're called not to run away from or avoid the wilderness, but to allow the Spirit to lead us to a place where we can be refined and renewed, transformed by the same Christ who has gone ahead of us. And we're reminded that God brings hope in any situation or circumstance, even ones that feel hopeless. Last week, we looked at the challenging theme of what it means to follow Jesus. The question, who do you say I am? What difference does that answer make in how others see you live your life? We were reminded that taking up our cross in following Jesus, that our place is behind Jesus to follow his lead, not what we think would work out best. And the message we hear over and over again through Lent, who do you say I am? Follow me. And today we look at another thing that challenges us. Just when we think everything is nice and fine or the one place at least that I feel close to God is safe from Jesus' challenge, we get today's reading. And only a couple of months after churches have been dutifully singing about baby Jesus, no crying he makes. Being the exemplar of mild, obedient and good, we have today's revolutionary upheaval at the hands of an angry Jesus. He cries out in frustration at the crass commercialization that had befallen the temple under the burden of the laws and rules governing temple sacrifices. And without putting too much testosterone in the story, it's a perfect antidote to the image of a Jesus that portrays him as passive, weakling, getting sand kicked in his face. This story also helps us immensely to understand why Jesus made enemies as much as friends. And in John's Gospel, we find this story right at the start, immediately after the wedding banquet in Cana. It's a rich contrast between party-going Jesus, a Jesus who ensures that the wine keeps flowing, and the regime-toppling Jesus who whipped up a frenzy in the courts of the temple. Today we look at the difficult tension between laws and love. Two things that, that both help us to understand and, and to live out what it means to be God's people. And two things that can be problematic when out of balance. 
for those who've been following the lectionary readings, the covenant story today is, is about the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20. And, and there's two main parts of the Ten Commandments, two, two things that they're there to prevent. One is idolatry and the other is injustice. If you follow these things, people, you will avoid the two things that we've found upsets God. We can look at all of the commandments as ways to avoid those things. God is first. Treat other people well. It's the opposite of loving God and loving neighbor are those two words. It's not the only place we find this in Scripture as reminders of, yes, these laws are great, but don't forget why they're there. To remind us about loving God and loving neighbor. In Micah 6, 8, we get, what does the Lord require of you? Act justly. Love kindness. Walk humbly with your God. In Luke 10, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And the prophet Amos, speaking in a time where, where people were stressed and exiled and not sure what to do. And oh, if we just do it the way we've, we've always done it, we'll, we'll follow all the laws and everything will be great. And the voice of the Lord comes to the people through Amos 5. This is from the message translation. I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, all your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your hymns and songs. When was the last time you truly sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness and mercy, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. We hear a similar challenge, an upsetting thing in our story today. Back to this scene outside the temple. I wonder what the real problem was here. Weren't they just doing their duty? Out of reverence for the temple? It's very easy and convenient for us to side with Jesus in this story. Yes, of course, they were doing it wrong. But the alternative is awkward. The alternative is is uncomfortable. After all, aren't we just doing our duty? Out of reverence for what we know and experience of, of what God is doing in our lives, in our place? How would we know any different? John's gospel starts with this, right at the start of the gospel. Matthew, Mark and Luke put it right just before Jesus, before Palm Sunday. As perhaps the tipping point for why the people, this was the last straw. But John places this right at the beginning. This is who this is. And in the first few stories in John, Jesus doesn't really say much. The focus is on, who is this? And there seems to be a sense of frustration with all the people in these scenes who have quite understandable and realistic responses. Those at the wedding, those in this scene, the next chapter with Nicodemus and then the, the woman at the well... Who is this? And the fact that this story was written long after Jesus' death is made explicit, not only in the story, but with the editorial notes and asides explaining how people later interpreted these events and 
caught all the scriptural importance of it. This was an act of shocking disobedience toward the powerful rulers of the temple. Even if at the same time an act of great obedience to the justice and truth of his father, whatever the cost to himself. John's exploration of the importance of this event is made clearer by the connection he makes between the physical temple and Christ's body. John places this powerful story early because he wants to give a clear indication right from the beginning that Jesus' way would replace whatever people had known. Just as Jesus completely flipped the traditions at the wedding of Cana, now he flips the tables in the temple. The world is changing by what Jesus is doing. But in doing so, Jesus reveals the way the world is supposed to be. When laws get out of balance, when they begin to shackle and bind people unnecessarily in order to maintain the system, love comes in to turn it on its head. We might ask in this story, why didn't Jesus just politely ask the traders to leave? Why didn't he politely ask the money lenders or put something in the suggestion box? His passion for his father and to overturn the corruption that surrounded the institutions that should have served his father's will set Jesus on a collision course that was inevitable. Which begs the question of us, what traditions do we cling to, possibly without even realising that they challenge God's will and holiness? Those of you who know me well know that I love memes. And I promised I'd uh, have a balance to my memes today. Here is one that's common around this particular text. Whenever someone asks you, what would Jesus do? Remind them that freaking out and flipping tables is a viable option. You know, when we go, ha, 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 ha. But another one to balance that. If you want to flip tables like Jesus, make sure you're also willing to die on the cross for the people sitting there. suddenly the story becomes a whole lot more serious. This wasn't just about rage quitting a a board game or Jesus having a bad day. This was about love overflowing. What are you doing, people? An overflowing of God's incredible love. That people are blind to. What if we are the stall holders in the story? What if we don't really know what's going on? What tables would Jesus turn over at our house? At our school? In our life, in our work? What would be turned over if Jesus came to church here? During Lent, we're invited in that wilderness space to allow the Holy Spirit to bring those things out from under the rug. For us to surrender them to God. That we allow ourselves to be refined and renewed by God's love.
Joe, if you want to go and grab the... I'd love to read a prayer written by John Vandelaar based on this passage. Truth be told, Jesus, there are a lot of tables that need overturning in our lives. Beneath the veneer of respectability, the tidy rows and neat regulations, hide difficult addictions and angry judgments, hungry greeds and heartless rejections. We know the pain, Lord, and so do those around us. The pain of keeping up the facade. What a relief it would be to have it all upset, overturned, smashed, scattered, destroyed. So perhaps, Jesus, perhaps today you could pay us a visit and help us to radically rearrange the furniture in our lives. We ask this humbly, vulnerably, hopefully, in your name. Amen. As we prepare to come to Christ's table this morning, we have a chance to bring our offering to God. We're not just talking about finances, although how we do that in a planned way is important. Many of us have ways of doing that already, and there is a link in the chat bar. But as the offering bags come around, they're less of a tool to collect things that we don't carry much anymore, but more of a way of reminding us what it is that we're surrendering and offering to God this morning. So as that happens and as the bags come around, we're going to be singing a song that reminds us of God calling us, gathering us to be God's people, welcoming us to this place, to this meal, where God is the host and we are the guests. So let us sing this morning.
Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for all the gifts you give to us. Most of all, for the gift of your presence with us. For the gift of Jesus, our Saviour. And the presence of the Holy Spirit to empower and strengthen us. Lord, use these gifts, all that we have, all that we offer, however meagre or ordinary. Transform them into something extraordinary for your kingdom and for your glory. We pray in and through Jesus' name. Amen. Let us continue in our prayers for others. We come to God with our prayers of intercession. Let's spend some time with him, thinking of others and our world, but how he challenges us this morning. Let's pray. God of passion, we give you thanks today for all those who are passionate about your kingdom. We seek today to follow the Christ who not only offers us grace, but also rages at injustice. We seek to stand beside him, to lean into the uncomfortable that we might follow. We pray for those who work tirelessly to point out injustice, to do something about it. We pray too for those who use anger and rage as instruments for change. Help us to get angry too. Drive us to rage for love. We pray for those who speak up to ensure that all children and all people are treated with fairness and compassion. We give you thanks for those who work to ensure that none is excluded because of race or gender or sexual orientation. For those who work hard to include the poor and the marginalised, the unloved and the unwanted. We pray for those who have given their lives to call out injustice. Those who march those who rally, those who organise and fundraise, who lobby and who listen. We lift up those who feel tired of fighting for justice, who have been ostracised by us and ridiculed by us for wanting and expecting more. We lift up those who have been disbelieved and who feel disillusioned. Give them hope, Father. Give them strength, we pray. We give you thanks to all those who embody your love, a love that knows no bounds, a passion that ignites a fire to act for change. And we give you thanks for this love and this passion today. We need those who shout it out from the rooftops, from the halls of government and in the streets. Help us to embrace those qualities in ourselves. Help us to live out our radical faith with passion and conviction, starting with this place and with these people us. May we reach out to one another. May we stand up for one another. May we be known as a welcoming, worshipping community where there is always room for more and where the love of God is freely shared to all who come. Where hurt and judgment is not allowed to fester. Where intolerance is just not tolerated where we can and do get angry when others are mistreated. Let us love in his name. Let us rage in his name. And let us stand together for his love. In the name of God, who bids all welcome and loved, we pray. Let us take some time now to share in the words that Jesus taught us. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. So we come to the table of the Lord. And, and friends, if you've got that, please bring them forward. We've had some uh, wonderful cooking happening at Grow this morning. And uh, we're truly blessed for that to be uh, shared with us as our feast this morning. So we come to our communion service and those who might remember from Vision Sunday, uh, there were five eyes that were part of our service that help us to remember um, how we celebrate this when we come together. We always have some kind of introduction to remind us what it is we're doing. This is the table of the Lord that God invites us here. Those who love him a little and want to learn how to love him more. We come not because we're smart, popular, beautiful, perfect, intelligent, rich, or any of those things that might make us feel important or the world says is important. We come because God invites us to be here as God's beloved children. So come all of you who long for a fairer world, a fuller life, a deeper faith. What we do here, we do in imitation of what Christ first did. I invite you to join in with the responses on the screen. Here is the company of heaven. Here is the bread and the wine. Here is Jesus Christ. This is is the belonging place. Here are the people of God. Here is the congregation of heaven. Here is the story of God. This is the belonging place. Here is the table of life. Here is the grace of God. And here is the love of Jesus. This is the belonging place. And whoever we are and aren't, and whatever we believe and don't, we belong here at the table. And so with invocation, we pray for the Holy Spirit to be here just as Jesus did. Oh, institution, sorry, I jumped ahead. Jesus gave an example and command rooted in the experience he shared with his disciples in an upper room. On the night he was betrayed, he took a piece of bread and broke it and he gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body given for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. And after supper, he took a cup and he said, this cup, this is the new covenant the new promise of God, sealed with my blood for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, remember me. So now we do what Jesus did. We take this bread, this juice, the products of the earth, the fruit of human labor. In these, Jesus has promised to be present. And through these, Jesus makes us whole. So we pray a prayer of invocation. Holy Spirit, as we gather here in this place and all the places where we tune in today, send down your Holy Spirit on these that they may be for us your body, healing, forgiving, making us whole, that we may be for you your body, 
your hands and feet, your agents of love in this world. Amen. This morning, these elements will be brought to you where you're sitting. I invite you to hold on to them and uh, we will eat them and drink them together. There's some uh, beautiful bits of bread that the children have made as part of Grow and there are some gluten-free cubes in each of those as well. And we will take them, we'll hold on to them and we'll share together. Come, all is prepared.
the simple act of eating and drinking reminds us that Jesus is present in every part of our life, however boring or simple that may seem. Something we all do. And in these we know that Jesus is with us and that God loves us. So we eat, we drink, and we are thankful. I invite you to join me in our prayer after communion. God of grace, you renew us at your table with the bread of life. Take us, renew us and remake us. What we have been is now past. What we shall be through you still awaits us. Lead us on in the power of your love that our lives may bring you glory and honour. We ask this in the name of Jesus our Lord. We have a few announcements before we finish this morning. Uh, and the first one, I believe, is just a reminder. Last week we talked about Easter Madness, which is coming up. It's the week after Easter this year. A wonderful way for our young people. It's a camp for high schoolers organised across the state. Uh, and also a fantastic opportunity for people to grow as leaders. Um, and if you wanted to contribute in some way to that... The links are all in the church updates. There's also some envelopes on the Connect desk that uh, you can put something in that and just hand it to the Connect team. So if you're stuck afterwards, see one of the Connect team and they can help you with that. Coming up over the next few Sundays in March, next week, uh, I'll be away next weekend, but uh, Mike will be uh, leading us next week, which will be wonderful. And uh, 17th of March is the Lent 5. It's happening very quickly. And Palm Sunday is coming up on the 24th. That's a big day. We've got our congregational meeting at 10 o'clock. There'll be some papers coming out in the next couple of weeks for that. And, uh, of course, that night on uh, Palm Sunday, we share in a Seder meal where we look at some of the elements of the kind of meal Jesus would have been sharing with his disciples and what that, how that was significant for the Jewish people and what it is that we can take from that um, for us it's the beginning of holy week and of course the last week in march is going to be a really busy one too with all of our easter services and that'll be a separate document coming out next week for everyone as well reminder of our grow rotations we had cooking today next week's mission then there's art if any of those things are things that excite you be sure to uh see one of the grow team see katie or Faye or emma and uh ask how can i get involved what can i do how can i be part of that and of course if Grow is something God's been putting on your heart as a way you can help serve uh, or follow Jesus better this year. By all means, talk to one of the team there. Just a reminder of our congregational meeting as well. Good. Um, our book and plant sale coming up. Emails have been coming out about that. It looks exciting. And uh, next week, there will be some forms that you can start filling in about our church camp this year, which promises to be very exciting. One thing I would love to just remind people is on Vision Sunday we had some forms where some people who, who are good at thinking and writing in the moment were able to jot down some ways that they would like to follow more in 2024, maybe how they could learn or grow or share Jesus more. Um, if you took some time to think and you'd rather do it online, those links are now available in the church updates each week and there's some hard copies in the, on the Connect desk if you wanted to hand that to the Connect team anytime. That would be wonderful. I invite you to stand for our benediction this morning. We follow God who leads us into the world. We follow Jesus, the man of action. We follow the Spirit who gives us courage. Father, Son and Spirit, leading us all on to make a difference until all know the power of and the love of God. Jesus is waiting. Let's accept the invitation. Amen. Let's sing together. Amen.